Thank you. So today I will talk about work that I mainly did while doing my PhD uh, back in Nijmegen under the supervision of Erik Pol. So this is uh, yet another TLS talk, but this time we're not going to look at cryptographic attacks or problems that you have with certificate verification, but we look at another area where it also can go, well, possibly quite horribly wrong. Um, since this is the first TLS talk of this session, for all the people who managed to skip all the TLS talks this week, a short introduction uh, to TLS, which might help to later appreciate uh, the, the attacks that we found. So this is how a regular TLS session more or less looks like. So you, depending on the cipher suite and some options, you can have some additional messages. But the, a TLS session will start with a client hello that the client sends to the server to indicate its capabilities. So the cipher suite and some possible extensions. Uh, the server will then uh, pick a cipher suite, respond uh, to possible extensions, uh, send its certificate and a message that it's done with its part. Then the client will uh, construct a shared key uh, puts the data that is necessary for the server to also construct the shared key in the client key exchange message and then sends a message called a change cipher spec. So this message indicates that all the data afterwards that is sent by the client will be encrypted with the uh, agreed keys. And then after this, um, the first encrypted message that will be sent by the client is the finished message and this message contains a hash of all the previous handshake messages to provide integrity of the, of the previous handshake. These messages are sent to the server. The server also uh, computes the shared key, um, sends the change cipher spec to indicate that it also starts encrypting the data, and also it generates the hash, which is then packed into the finished message to provide integrity of the handshake so far. And if both the client and the server are happy, then they can start exchanging application data, which is hopefully encrypted. Um, then if something goes wrong, we also have a, the alert protocol. So the client or the server can send alert messages, either fatal or warning, with a specific reason. So this can be various things, but well, some interesting ones are bad Mac or uh, internal errors. Now what we are interested in in TLS implementations are the state machines. So a state machine basically specifies which message you want to accept in what state of the system. So as soon as you implement a protocol, you have to also implement the, the corresponding state machine. And despite that it's well, quite vital to do this correctly, um, there's no, usually not a formal uh, state machine in the specifications and people come up with it, have to extract the state machine from pros, uh, pro specifications, which as we will see might not always uh, end up well. So the, we look at the state machines using a formal um, specification called melee machines for the ones uh, that missed this in their uh, computer science classes. A melee machine is, consists of a set of states. Um, it has an input alphabet, so messages that can be sent to the system. It has an output alphabet, so messages that can be returned from, by the system. And for every state, for each input, it defines what, the out, what output will be returned by the, by the system and what the next state is. So it can either stay in the current state or it can continue to the next state. And this is an unambiguous way to specify these state machines, which would be good to actually have in specifications so people don't have to come up with these themselves anymore. Of course, just having a state machine is not uh, enough specification in itself because you also need to specify what computations actually need to be performed if you receive a specific message and if you are in a particular state. Now we are interested in how these state machines are implemented in uh, real life TLS implementations. 
Um, and we want to do this in a, well, basically a black box approach. So we do not want to analyze the code itself and try to extract it. So we, um, we try to infer the state machine that is implemented in the implementation by only communicating with this instance. So we send TLS messages to the system and see how it reacts. And based on this, we try to uh, learn how the state machine is implemented and see if this is done correctly or whether weird things happen. So basically what we do is we fuss the, the message order. So we don't fuss a, a single message. We just have a fixed set of messages, but the order of messages uh, changes. Um, and as we will show, see later, this is a useful technique to discover some bugs, some security related. Um, it can provide some interesting insights in what the programmers might have been thinking. But unfortunately, it will not find a carefully hidden backdoor. So it will find, well, basically honest mistakes, but you could easily hide a backdoor that this technique will not find either by uh, looking at a payload. So you have a specific payload that might trigger a backdoor or you just send the same message uh, many, many times. So if you send the same message 100 times, and then something special happens, then probably this technique will not find it. So I would like to start uh, by giving you an intuitive idea of how uh, learning works. So I will start with an example of learning a TLS server implementation. Um, so we start with a, an empty hypothesis, hypothesis. So at this moment, we don't know anything about the system yet and we start to communicate to the system and see how it responds. So first, for example, we send a client hello uh, message to the server, and then we see that the server responds with a server hello message. And so we add this, uh, this pair as a, as a transition to the, to the system or to our, our hypothesis. So we add a self loop that says, if I send a client hello, uh, the server will return a server hello. Um, we also try this with all the other messages in our alphabet and we see that all the other messages are responded to with a fatal alert and the connection is closed. So we also add these to our hypothesis. Um, of course, I, I merged all the messages here together because otherwise it would become a big mess, but you get the idea. Now we have the have a hypothesis when we look at only uh, traces of length one, but of course the protocol is a bit more sophisticated than that. So we continue and we send uh, two messages after each other. So we send two client hellos, and then suddenly we see that the last response that we receive is a fatal alert and a connection close. So, and this does not match with the hypothesis that we have so far. So apparently the first client hello uh, puts us in, a, in another state than the initial state. So we add another state. So we have a transition. If we receive a client hello, we receive, or if we send a client hello, we receive a server hello, and we end up in a different state. But apparently then, if we send a client hello, we suddenly get a fatal alert and a connection close. And you continue with this process until you have a have a complete state machine that represents uh, the implementation or that corresponds to the implementation that you're testing. Now the actual setup that we use is a bit more complicated than this because you need to know when to stop learning basically. Um, and we, we want to learn a deterministic melee machine. So for this we use uh, a tool that implements the following approach. You have two components in this system. You have a learner and a teacher. And the teacher is supposed to know exactly the state machine that you're trying to learn. And the learner tries to come up with a hypothesis uh, of the state machine of the system that the teacher uh, knows or can talk to. And to do this, the learner can ask three different kinds of uh, questions from, to the teacher. So it can either send a reset command, basically. So this tells the teacher to reset the system that it's uh, learning to reset it to its to the initial state. The learner can send an output query so the 
uh, teacher will tell the learner what the system would respond with if you send this, these messages to the system. And then using these two commands, the learner tries to come up with a hypothesis. And if it has a hypothesis that um, matches some criteria, um, it will send uh, its hypothesis to the learner or to, to the teacher using an equivalence query. And then the teacher will say, yes, this is exactly the state machine that you were trying to learn. Or it will say, no, this is not correct. Here you have a counterexample. Um, and using this counterexample, the learner expands its uh, hypothesis and continues learning. Now, of course, we don't have a, a teacher that really knows the state machine that we want to learn, because otherwise we wouldn't be learning it. So we have to uh, somehow ap approximate uh, these equivalence queries. So there are several ways to do this. Um, two methods that we use are either random traces, so you just send a fixed number of random traces to the system. You see, you look at the responses that come back, and if they all match the hypothesis, at some point you say, okay, now I'm convinced that this state machine matches the one that is implemented. If you want a bit more guarantees, you can use, uh, for example, Chow's W method. So this method can give you a guarantee that, it found, that you found the correct state machine, given that you have an upper bound on the number of states. And the learner uses an algorithm uh, called L star, the L star algorithm by Anglin. And Nisa adapted this algorithm so it, you can use it for, uh, to learn Mealy machines. Now, to learn this, we made use of an existi existing tool um, that was developed at the uh, TU Dortmund. Um, they have an implementation of this adapted L-star algorithm and also the equivalence algorithms that we, uh, that we used. Now, we modified the W method as it, as it is implemented uh, in LearnLib to make use of some, well, basically domain knowledge to reduce the number of queries that we need to send to the TLS implementation. Um, so what we make use of is that as soon as a, a socket is closed, we will not receive any interesting data on it anymore, by definition. So where the W method will just happily continue sending queries that are longer, even though you know that a certain prefix will always close the socket connection, we actually stopped the algorithm for trying those longer, uh, longer queries because it doesn't make sense to try to find, co find counterexamples if you already know that the connection will be closed after the first three messages, for example. Now, to talk to TLS implementations, of course, we need to be able to send TLS messages. So for this, we had to build a custom test harness so this test harness uh, translates uh, sim symbols that are used within the algorithm to actual uh, TLS messages that, uh, that the implementation understands that we are testing. And then when we finally have, a, have a, a state machine, we get a nice PDF that shows all the states and the transitions. We inspect it and see if we see anything funny going on. So whether we see more states than we would expect whether there are weird transitions that shouldn't be there, or um, if we see, for example, weird alert messages. So as I said before, the, a bad Mac is usually an indication that something fishy is going on. Now, the, te the test harness that we have is an well, almost stateless TLS implementation, because we need to be able to send TLS messages in well, any random order. Um, but we still need to have at least some minimal state in this because we want to be able to handle encryption. We need to remember the keys that we agreed on with the server, and we want to remember whether the server expects messages to be encrypted in, the, in one of the two directions. And if we would not add this, then we wouldn't learn that much interesting. Um, our test harness uh, supports both test and uh, client and server messages. So we can test both client and server side. And it has support for all the regular TLS messages as well as the heartbeat extension. 
and it supports the RSA and Diffie Hellman key exchange, um, some client authentication, and we have some extra special symbols that correspond with exceptions that can occur in the test harness. So for example, the connection is closed or the decryption fails on our side, either because the padding is wrong, the Mac doesn't check out, things like that. Now, one of the things we did was we analyzed uh, nine TLS uh, implementations on the server side. So you have some big ones and some smaller ones. And the thing that was obvious when you first looked at the mo learned models already was that every model that we learn is different. Nobody implements TLS in the exact same way. So it can be uh, just alert messages that are slightly different or you just have additional states that should not be there, uh, different transitions that should not happen. And even the two RSA uh, implementations are quite different. So after the analysis, we get, a, we get models like this. Um, and we we clean them up a bit, so these are all, here we already have merged the transitions that are um, that are the same, have to return the same output or go to the same states. But before this, you have a huge unreadable state machine. But this is already quite easy to uh, to read and see if funny things happen. Now here you see the collection of uh, models that we learned for these nine uh, different implementations. So some. For some implementations, we learn different models or different versions. And you can see that all of them are different. So here I did some manual layout to make it a bit more readable for the, for the poor reviewers. Now, when they were available, we used the demo applications that were, pro were provided by the implementations. Um, and the models that we learned had from six stage states, which is kind of what you expect, expect all the way up to 16 states, which is a bit too much. Um, the running time for this particular experiment was from six minutes to over eight hours. And the eight hours uh, uh, work was caused basically by an implementation that would just not close its connection, even if something went wrong. And then we could not take advantage of our modification of the W method. So it would just try to keep searching for counterexamples, even though the server will never respond anymore, but the connection is still open. Um, so if the connections are properly closed, then at least it should be done, or these experiments were done in under an hour. And the time was also a bit dependent on uh, the timeouts that we used. So after each query, we have a specific time that we wait for the implementation to respond and because we don't know if we, when we send a message whether it's just waiting for another message from us or whether um, it's just doing some expensive crypto operations that, and it just needs a bit longer. So some implementations we had to set the timeout up to over a second because otherwise we didn't receive the, all the messages that the server tried to send to us. And this simple analysis already resulted in several flaws in different implementations. So the most interesting one, I guess, is the Java one. Um, so the, the Java implementation makes it possible to have a very efficient implementation of TLS because you don't have to do the crypto anymore on one side of the connection. So you can skip the change cipher spec message that is sent to the server. And if you don't send this, then the server is perfectly happy to accept the plain text data that you send to it. Um, a similar problem is also present in the client, but there it's even worse. So after the, first, after the server sends the server hello, the client will accept a finished message at any point. So even before it received the certificate or before it started to encrypt the uh, data. Um, and quite a coincidence was that both, that also the, the same bug was found by the people from the Prosecco group at INRIA. So I was visiting them in December last year and then we discovered that we actually reported the exact same bug to Oracle 
even though it must have been in there for years and years. And then beginning of this year, Oracle finally patched it in one of their uh, critical updates. Now GNU TLS did something funny when it came to heartbeat uh, messages. So of it, according to the spec, during the handshake, you should not send or receive uh, heartbeat messages. Um, and then you're supposed to ignore them. But what GNU TLS did was a bit different. So if it received a, a heartbeat message during the, the handshake, you ended up in kind of a shadow path. So all the responses that you would get after this were exactly the same apart from the, the finished message, because then suddenly an internal error uh, happened. So this was a bit funny behavior. So we started to look into the code. And then it turned out that as soon as a heartbeat message was received by the, by the server, it reset the buffer that was used to uh, store all the handshake messages which are used in the finished message. So we were still collecting all the handshake messages that were exchanged, but then the finished message didn't match anymore with the finished message by GNU TLS. Um, so this means that you don't have any integrity anymore about messages that happen before you send the heartbeat request because GNU TLS just forgets about them, basically. It might be a bit hard to actually exploit this, but this is definitely not behavior that you would like to have in your client. And the same problem exists on both sides. So both the server and the client have this. If they receive the heartbeat message, they just forget all the messages that they collected so far. Um, and this was luckily fixed by now uh, in version 3.3.9. Then we have OpenSSL. So this was uh, the implementation that actually had 16 states. Um, and here you had something funny after you already had a successful handshake. If you then suddenly, if you then send another additional change cipher spec, so you send two, uh, yeah, the second one, then for some reason the implementation decides to switch keys. So the server suddenly starts to use uh, the server keys in both directions. So both for receiving data and for sending out data. And it expects a, a weird order of messages and then suddenly both sides end up communicating with the, with the same key. Um, so this was not considered to be a, a, a real security problem because it only happened after the handshake. But again, this is really not something that should be in there, but luckily it's fixed by now. Um, and recently I also started to look at LibreSSL, so that was not included here, and it turned out that they still had the same problem, and they are now looking into whether they should fix this or not. So we, before we started with this research, there was already a, a bug called the early CCS bug by Kikuchi. And here it was possible to send the CCS before a client key exchange. So if you would send this before the client key exchange, then there would not be a master secret yet to base the, the keys on. And the, the keys would be uh, based on the empty master, master secret. And so all the data that was used there would be public. So this is the version that was still vulnerable for this. So by, it was already fixed by the time that we started our analysis. But if we looked at this, at this version, we could see that if we sent that an change, if a change cipher spec was sent early, so before the client key exchange from, from state one, then at some point we got decryption failed errors. So this is usually an indication that something is terribly wrong because then somehow the keys are out of sync between the server and the client. And if you would have looked into this, then this would have been exactly the, the problem that uh, Kikuchi also found. And if we modify our test harness a bit to move uh, the location where we actually compute the keys that are used and the the hash that is used, then we can actually successfully trigger the bug even. And then a couple of months ago, um, 
I ran into the guys from uh, Not Quite So Broken TLS, so we will hear from them uh, in a bit. Um, so since I had my test harness, we decided to have a look at, uh, at their implementation. And also here, we saw, we saw that at some point, we got decryption failed errors. So this means that my test harness could not decrypt the message that it received. And then when we looked at the, the actual network traces, we could see that the, the message or the alert message, there were messages sent after these states there that were not encrypted. So even though a chain cipher spec was already exchanged, um, there was the alerts were not uh, encrypted. So this is probably not a very serious flaw, but Again, something that you shouldn't, you don't want to have in there. But it was luckily quick, quickly fixed. So by the time I got home again, I already had a mail that it was fixed, and I tested it, and it was, it was gone basically. But it does show that this technique is also very useful for developers during their, uh, during implementing TLS or any other protocol matter. And another funny thing we saw in the and the model that was learned was that they had a different interpretation of the standard. So where all the other uh, implementations I looked at so far send a chain cipher spec and a finished at the same time, and then the other side responds with a chain cipher spec and a finished, this implementation sends a chain cipher spec immediately after it receives the chain cipher spec. So this is not a not a, a major difference, but it still shows that the implement or the specification as it, as it is is not that specific, and developers can make different uh, choices. Now, what I'd like to conclude with some things we sh have shown that the protocol state fuzzing is a useful technique, so we can find some, well, at least one very serious security flaw but also we found some other smaller bugs that are related to the implementation of state machines. Um, everybody interprets specifications differently. Nobody managed to implement it in the same way. Um, and therefore, it would also be a good idea to just include a, a decent state machine specification in the specification of any protocol so people don't have to extract this anymore uh, from the pros uh, specifications as it is now. With that, I would like to thank you for your attention and for any questions. Uh, hi, Adam Langley. Can I get you to run this on Boring SSL and send me the PDF? No problem. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, uh, Sam Scott. Thanks very much for the talk. It was uh, very good. Um, something I'm interested in, so besides from the bug stuff, because that's obviously very interesting, but did you find any surprising differences between the interpretations of the specifications where you thought it was just maybe written so badly that they came up with two completely different interpretations? Um, yeah, so the most obvious chain, uh, difference was with the chain, the chain cipher spec. But and then, of course, all the alert messages are completely different. OK, thanks. Just uh, giving you a discussion, like, do you, do you know why is it that there's no uh, um, formal state machine that's in the standard? So like TLS 1.3 is being worked on now, and there's no, st no state machine specified in there uh, either. Is that something that you would take away from your, from your talk? Sorry? Is that a takeaway from your talk, that maybe there should be a state machine in the standard? It would be very good to have one, I guess, yeah. So one of the things I promised to do for TLS 1.3 and haven't yet is to merge all the messages in a single flow into one message so that, that there's just way, way fewer states. There is no reason in TLS that you, know, you, you expect message A, B, C, all in order, why aren't they one message? So, um, ho hopefully at that point, the state machine in TLS 1.3 is so simple, it's almost irrelevant to describe it, but maybe we should anyway. <laughs>